Good evening, everybody, and welcome to Matters of Faith, the radio show. Matters of Faith is a show. Good evening, everybody, issues and welcome to, to Matters you, the of listening Faith, the radio show that will Matters challenge, Faith, encourage, motivate, and inspire you to keep the faith. I am your host, the Reverend Dr. J. Lauren Russell, and it's my job to engage you in stimulating dialogue, dialogue that's inspiring, encouraging, motivating, dialogue and conversations that will help you build your determination, your commitment, and your character, conversations that will help you keep the faith. Everyone born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. 1 John 5 and 4. And now, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, without further ado, it is time for Matters of Faith, the radio show. It's Monday, July 17th, it's 8 o'clock, and it's time for Matters of Faith, the radio show. I am your host, the Reverend Dr. J. Lauren Russell, and tonight we're talking about the topic and the article, One of the Greatest Lessons to Learn. One of the Greatest Lessons to Learn. My very special guest tonight, Chaplain Ron Carson. You don't want to miss this show, Telephone, Tell a Friend. We're on Matters of Faith, as well as the J. Lauren Russell Facebook groups. Make sure you telephone, make sure you tell a friend. They don't want to miss this episode tonight. One of the greatest lessons to learn with Chaplain Ron Carson. Don't forget to support our advertisers and our sponsors, the JLR Company and J. Lauren Russell Consulting, LLC, for all of your church financial consulting needs. Check out our website, www.jlorenrussellconsulting.com. That's www.jlorenrussellconsulting.com or simply give us a call, 718-328-8096, 718-328-8096. If you want to train your trustees, if you want to develop your property, if you need a church loan, give us a call. We'll be there to help. Matters of Faith, the book, can be purchased at my cash app, dollar sign Matters of Faith. The cost of the book is $22.80. That's $22.80. You can send your check of money order to the JLR company, Post Office Box 301, New York, New York, 10035. That's Post Office Box 301, New York, New York, 10035. Get the book. It will absolutely bless your life. You can also get it as an ebook. All you need to do is go to www.smashwords.com backslash books backslash view backslash 993177. That's www.smashwords.com backslash books backslash view backslash 993177. The book has no shipping and handling if you get it as an ebook. And also check out the Eat Okra app for all black owned restaurants all over the nation. That's right, Eat Okra. And finally, subscribe, like, and share our Matters of Faith YouTube channel. Make sure that you subscribe, like, and share our Matters of Faith YouTube channel. Let me add just one more thing. Get your subscription to Better Mag Magazine today. A two-year subscription is only $27.50. That's www.abettermag.com. www.abettermag.com. The installation is over, but I do want to have you and give you an opportunity to hear my remarks as I receive this great honor as the district governor for District 7230 of Rotary International. So I'm going to do that with you now. So if you give me a minute, I'm going to switch my screen over. I'm going to do a new share with you. And then I'm going to share with you what was said on the night of. So just give me a moment. Um, this does take a little bit of ingenuity and stuff like that, but I think we're there. Uh, I see it there. Okay, here we go. This has been an interesting journey, and um, I never had any intention of being a district governor of Rotary International. In fact, I'll tell you the God's honest truth. When I was first asked to go to a Rotary meeting from my boss, um, I asked him, what was Rotary? He said, you don't know what Rotary is? I I said, can I be transparent and clear? Can I tell you the truth? He said, yes. 
I said, I thought it was a part of the Ku Klux Klan. Because oh. <laughs> nobody that I've ever known has been in the Rotary, and nobody's ever talked about it in my lifetime, and I'm not a young child. I was in my 40s. And we laughed about it. He said, no, that's not what it is. And he began to explain to me that it's a literally a service club that allows you to serve needy humanity from your own place of residence, but it can extend throughout the world. And I said, sure, I'd go. And I went to this club. It was a Yonkers club. There were two clubs at the time. And when I got there, there was a woman by the name of Vera DeMarco. I'll never forget her. She was the first woman president that that club had. And it's then maybe, how many years was it? I want to say 87 years. The first woman president. And I enjoyed her because she had to make a place for herself as the president of that club. And so we bonded. I was the youngest guy there. Wasn't the only black person, but I was the youngest guy there. And so it became, for me, a place that I went back to and I began to understand that you can make a difference in the lives of others in this thing called Rotary. And so I got involved. And about maybe four, two, three years later, I became the president for the first time. I was president three times. <laughs> but now I'm the district governor. And I say that because I want you to think about in front of you, you have in front of you, you have a program. And that program has more about Rotary than it does about me, because it's not about me, it's about we. How do we work together to make a difference in the communities that we live in? And you can do it right here in your own backyard, but yet you can impact people around the world. Isn't that amazing? That you can do a little, you can take a little bit, the little bit that you have and add it to what other people have and impact the world and make a difference in the lives of people that you will never, ever meet. They'll never know that it was you. But you wake up in the morning knowing that you did something that made a difference in the lives of people that you will never meet. That to me, is worth more than the challenges that, that I may face going forward. And so I invite you, and, I, and today is special because today is July 12th. Tomorrow would have been my father's birthday. My father passed away when I was 20 years old. The last birthday that he had, he was sick and in the hospital with cancer. And his birthday occurred, for them, some of you who have been around a while, remember the blackout of 1977? Yeah. Well, that was his birthday. And that was the first time I did not go to see him in the hospital because I did not want to see him like that on his birthday. And all the lights went out. That was the last birthday he had. And so from the time, all of my adult life, I've been without parents, my, my mom died uh, five years before my dad did. So all of my life has been about learning to live in community and society without having the backdrop of a parent or an undergirding of a parent or a safety net of a parent because if you did something wrong and you messed up, there was no one there to catch you. I don't know if you've ever experienced that before. But Rotary has shown me that you don't have to be blood related to have a safety net. And when you do something good for other people, you know that could have been me that could have benefited from that service that they were providing. So why not do it for somebody else? So that they won't miss what I did because there was no one there to do it for me. Why not bring Rotary into a community that never knew of Rotary before? and let them have an opportunity to serve humanity, needy humanity, right in their own backyard and make a difference around the world. You know, the pebble that goes into the, the, the ripple has an impact on the entire lake. That's what I want to challenge you with today. I want to challenge you to look beyond the confines of your own community, to look above yourself. The number one theme in Rotary is service above self. What are you doing to make a difference in the lives of others? And here's another one. 
If you do something good for someone and they find out that it's you, it doesn't count. You got to do it again. So let me say it again. I want you to hear this. If you do something good for someone and they find out that it was you, it doesn't count. You got to do it again. That's success, by the way. Success is doing the same thing that you did before that was successful over and over and over again because it's the right thing to do. So I challenge you all to let your light so shine that others may see the glory that you have in you and that you'll make a difference in the lives of people around you and beyond your reach that you'll never get to know. God bless you. I love you. And there's nothing you can do about it. So good <laughs> Well, that did it. That was the one. Just wanted to share that with you so that you would have an understanding and know what it was that I accepted to do. And now the article, one of the greatest lessons to learn. That article can be found in my column, Matters of Faith, at the Bronx Chronicle, www.thebronxchronicle.com, Yonkers Insider, www. Oops. That should not have happened, guys. I'm going to go back for a second. I want to page up. And I want to go back to this page up. Let's do this again. Sorry about that. Um, I need to give you, make sure that you understand this. Uh, www.yonkersinsiders.blogspot.com, thebronxchronicle.com, www.abettermag.com, Black Westchester Magazine, and Pamela's Big Heart Newsletter. Philippians chapter 4, verses 8 through 13, New King James Version. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. The things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do, and the God of peace will be with you. But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at last your care for me has flourished again. Though you surely did care, but you lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be abased, and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. One of the greatest lessons to learn. What will it take for you to be content, to live in a state of happiness and satisfaction? I guess the answer to that question depends on your worldview. Some live in a fantasy world where they think winning the lottery would do just fine. Others fantasize about climbing the corporate ladder or getting a big raise. Still others think the right man or the right woman will bring them the contentment they crave. Maybe moving into a new neighborhood or the house of their dreams, the size and scope of your definition of contentment will depend on how you view the world. Paul puts forth a different perspective because his view was shaped by his sky view. He was no longer basing his contentment on earthly creature comforts, but on things that were inspired by God. Paul said, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue and if there is anything praiseworthy. He went on to say that it wasn't the material things that Philippians shared with him that brought him a sense of contentment, although he appreciated every gift. Paul says the things that were given to him were nice, but he learned one of his greatest lessons when he learned how to be content in whatever state he was in. It didn't matter if he had material things or not, prosperous or in need, hungry or full, in agony or ecstasy. Paul learned how to be content in any and every situation. He learned from his sky view what, that whatever he needed to do, wanted to do, had to do, he could do through Christ who strengthens him. In verse 9, Paul tells his readers the things which he learned and received and heard and saw in me. 
these do, and the God of peace will be with you. That's before he tells them about one of the greatest lessons he ever learned in verse 11. I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. If we, as readers of this letter to the Philippian church, follow the example Paul gave, we will be able to proudly proclaim that we have also learned one of the greatest lessons that was taught. Be content with whatever state you are in. Be blessed. Amen. Nope, not ready. We'll be there in a minute, Bon. Hold on. We get there. Yeah, I'm with you. And now my question. What will it take for you to be content with what you have, to live in a state of happiness and satisfaction, no matter your situation or circumstance? What will it take for you to be content with what you have, to live in a state of happiness and satisfaction, no matter your situation or circumstance? Well, Mazda Faith family, this gives me a great deal of pleasure to introduce my guest for tonight. I want you to take a deep breath because I'm going to have to do the same. <laughs> I'm going to tell you his credentials and then I'm going to let him talk about himself. Chaplain Ron Carson was born in New York City, raised in public housing in the South Bronx, graduated from DeWitt Clinton High School, has an AA associate's degree in liberal arts from Queensboro Community College, an A.S. Mechanical and Structural Design from Lehigh Tech, a B.A. in Theology and Pastoral Counseling from Biblical Life College and Seminary, a Master's in Theology in Urban Sociology and Pastoral Counseling from Alliance Theological Seminary. He has several certifications, Harvard University School of Public Health and Leadership and Emergency Management, Lehman College Small Business and Development Management, University of West Virginia Principles and Management of High Voltage, National Safety Council, OSHA, New York State, Hillman Environment, Environmental, Verizon Communications and Design, CUNY, City University of New York, Principles of Management and Leadership, Safety and ergo manage, or Ergonomic Management, U.S. Military and Federal Government, Anti-Terrorism, New York State Education, Physical and Mental Abuse, IPA, Career uh, and Life Coach, Verizon Corporation Principles of Management and Leadership from C uh, State has CUNY, the City University of New York, and Prevention of Violence in the Workplace. What he is most proud of is being the dad of two wonderful daughters, both Ivy League graduates, Wharton and Tufts University. The list is too long for this short intro, and I want to have <laughs> something to talk about anyway. So, Matters of Faith family, would you welcome with me tonight my very special guest, this gentleman I met not long ago, but it's like we've known each other all of our lives. Chaplain Ron Carson. Good evening, and, and thank you for the, that, that beautiful introduction. Um, first of all, again, I want to congratulate you on becoming the district manager. For uh, the district, governor. district governor. District, district governor. I'm sorry. Yes, I had it right in front of me. A district governor. Uh, and what an honor it is to... to have met you. Uh, yeah, we met just several months ago on a cruise. And the, the Rev is a, a heck of a ping pong player, as well as a brilliant man. I, and I have to thank you for this opportunity this evening. Um, well, it's actually my pleasure. It's actually my pleasure to have you here because you are a phenomenal man who's doing phenomenal things. And now you're on this show so that everybody can, or everybody at least that's watching me will be able to understand who you are, what you are, what you do, and why you're on this show tonight. So let me ask you this question, Ron. Uh, I've read okay. some of your bio. I didn't read it all. Didn't read it all. I read some of it. So tell us something about you that we don't know and we really should know. You, you know, I had I had this conversation recently about us growing up in, in public housing and, and the fact that... Um, we, as, as, as people of color, if I can use the term, um, learning how to sell ourselves, if I can use the term, how to progress in life and, and develop the necessary tools, it, it, for me, it came later on in life. I, I always, I never saw myself in the position in life, but it was God. 
I'm going to tell you right now, it was God mm -hmm. that opened up these doors for me. Never in my life, because I wasn't a good teacher. I mean, a good student. Um, I was a good basketball player, okay? okay. okay. And, and so um, trials and tribulations came forward in my, my life. And then God opened up the door for me to go to seminary. God knows, I, I, you know, I said, me in seminary uh, yeah. and as such. So, and then he opened up additional doors. Never did I kid think that this kid from the projects in the South Bronx would accomplish mm. by God's grace what I accomplished um, from a design engineer for Verizon to a safety health environmental specialist to handling accounts for the federal government, the stock exchange, designing for them, and as such, interfacing with the individuals I interface with. Um, and as such, it, it still baffles me to this day, at, at this point in my life, that God opened up these doors, because it was God. It was nobody else that opened up these doors for me. And even going into become a college professor at Bronx Community College, and I'm going to myself, I never taught in my life, but God did show me that I did teach. Hmm. When I was working as, a, even as, as an engineer, you're, you're teaching other individuals what the needs are for that particular uh, area, whether it was the New York Stock Exchange communication or as a safety health environmental specialist and working with teams of individuals, teaching them about safety or me taking over and actually um, putting together the protocol for ground zero when the buildings came down and as such. So I realized, I said, I do have these skills, but I never had confidence. But God gave me confidence. God spoke into my life. And then I wound up teaching 14 years at, for the city university. Um, and I get, how, how do I explain this? But other than God, God opened up these doors, meeting you. What was that? That was unbelievable. Sitting the other day with you amongst uh, judges and individuals from the White House, and I'm I'm baffled and I'm going, I, I I can't, I just couldn't believe it. But God opens up doors for us if if we're if we're obedient. Mm -hmm. If we're obedient, so that that in itself, if if I could share that aspect, if we just take the time out in our lives to focus on our gifts and not let anybody steal that from you. And know sometimes, I always share with my students in college, we, we reach our goals different ways. You know, and this, you know, we, whether you're a person that reads or, or a connected person that use your hands or you're a person that learns visually, but we all have these gifts. And, and growing up, I didn't know what my gifts were until God showed them to me. So, uh, um, and here I am on, on a radio show talking about who I am and the trials and tribulations I went through in life and how they benefited me. Just like in the Bible, the struggles that Paul went through and Moses yeah. went through and all the, these, these individuals in the Bible, their struggles in life, but how they turned their lives around or God turned their lives around, the Holy Spirit turned their lives around, Christ turned their lives around. So we have to look at those trials and tribulations in our lives and learn from them. And sometimes we want to push back. Mm. When you gave your testimony on last Wednesday and the struggles you went through growing up and the difficulties, and we had some other conversations, you as an individual, but you took those opportunities, you ran with them. And, and that, so I love, how do I say, I love doing what I'm doing, working with kids. And my goal is to, as my business card says, is to educate the kids. Um, my mission is to equip them with the education and competent skills to compete in today's society. Mm. And, and, and I'm struggling with that, with the educational system, because mm. they, they've taken that gift away. You and I, we, we went to school and we learned all these aspects. 
whether it was through music and arts or we talked about um, going to Bronx vacation where back in the day it was an automotive trade school and all. But our kids, are, you know, with the STEM program, they're left in the open. And they, they, these, these skills, they're, they don't know. Mm. And, 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 I, I, and I always told my students, uh, when, you, you, when you went to speak to another professor and they said, well, they, 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 you, they, you should know this. We can't assume anything in life. Mm. And there's a road that has to be taken. And what's the road for each and every one of us? It's different. You know, I was, I was just reading earlier today, uh, you know, about um, belief and, and faith and, and the, the various domination, the denominations that exist in the, in the United States alone. There's over 2,000 denominations. And so is that confusing or what is at times, you know, the church can itself can be very confusing because we there's religiosity versus faith. And what, what are they based on? Hmm. You know, religion is 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 comes for me. It comes from hearing other people's opinions where faith is a relationship with God and faith. And, and as we read God's word. We gain and and we uh, our faith and we, we develop a relationship with God. We develop a relationship with His Word. So all of this, at, at this point in my life, I'm still learning. Mm -hmm. I'm yeah. still learning. Every day is a learning. And the first thing I do is I get up in the morning and I do my devotionals and I study. I said, God, what do you have for me to learn today? What is what what do you want me to hear today from you? And, and I, I find it so, so, so rewarding to, to take that time and, and not allow myself to be distracted. I, I set aside two hours every day where the phone's off, the computer's off, and it's me and God mm. and what he wants me to learn. So that, that's, I mean, I could rattle on and on and on and on and on, but uh, my life is what it is, you know, um, and all I want to do is keep moving forward and not just for me, but I want to move forward for our, our people out there that need to know who Christ is and, and what he is truly all about. And, and yesterday we were having this conversation. He's about love. He's about caring. Christ is not an individual that criticizes. He mm -hmm. teaches. Right? Rabbi, teacher. And I think that's so important. So what is this program about? You know, you, you do this. You, it's not to criticize. It's about faith. It's, it's about learning. And, and as I read your, your, the resources I, that you provide, that's all a learning tool. And um, Lauren, my struggle is how do we get this out there to our young people? I was reading this morning, I was listening to a lecture that, I, I think 10% of the young, our young people now are willing to go to church. Where's, where's the other 90%? What's happening? Why, why have we lost them? What can we do to correct it? So um, that's, that's what Ron Carson is all about. The kid from the Patterson Project that lost his father at 13 years old. You know, I just recently lost my mom. But because of my relationship with God, it wasn't a struggle. I would, it was a, I was, how, how do I say this? Um, I rejoiced that she was now with the Lord. I rejoiced that 102 years old, she's now with the Lord. She's with my dad. Wow. They're hanging out together, you know. Mm -hmm. My my mom never knew her mother because my mother's mother died uh, back in 1920 when my mother was five days old, mm -hmm. and and because she was Native American and black, she couldn't get in the hospital. My grandmother. So and this is stuff our kids need to know also of their history, the struggles. What did we go through? What did you go through to get where you're at in life? 
do we as men of God and women of God, as do we truly reveal our struggles? Because every one of us, I was reading, every one of us goes through a struggle in life. And we make mistakes. Amen? We it's make funny. mistakes. We make a lot of mistakes. Yeah. And, I, and what I found out even in the classroom, Rev, is when I share with my students the mistakes I made and where I came from, they embrace it. Mm. it the walls come down. The walls come down. When I tell them I came from the projects, they go, no way. Mm. When I tell them I had to put paper in my shoes, they go, no way. But then I teach them the route. And then whether they're Muslim or any other, or they're non-religious, or whatever they happen to be, but they see the grace of God. They see the grace of Christ. They see the love through me. So I don't have to preach Adam. God and the Holy Spirit, it's the Holy Spirit does all the work. Just reveal. See, I asked, I said, tell me something about you that we didn't know. Now there's nothing about you that we don't know. <laughs> but that's great. I'm, I'm so glad that you revealed that and talked about that because you're right. Um, the, the struggles that we go through in life make us who we are today. And it's the choices that we make during those struggles that really determine the, the, the person that you're going to be. Because no one is exempt from having challenges, trials and tribulations in life. But what you do with those challenges, what you do with those trials, that's what makes the difference. And some people, they, they, they literally um, become angry at the trials. They become angry at the tribulations. And, and that anger is taken out on others. You know, they don't show the love and compassion. They literally resist and they pull back. So when, and I'll give you a, for instance, I remember, I remember making a conscious decision when my mother died. When my mother died, I was like, wow. It's 14 years old, like you when your dad died, 13 years old, I was 14 years old. My mother just simply dropped dead. She had an embolism, she was gone. My sister's on with us, she'd tell you. Um, she asked my father, what's gonna happen to us? And my father said, we're a family and we're gonna stick together. I, I, I mean, I remember, I remember the feeling I got like, my God, this is my dad. But here's the thing, I remember making a conscious decision that I wasn't gonna love people because the pain that I was experiencing was too intense. I never wanted to feel that again. Mm. So the only way I could do that was not to love people. Well, that's what I thought. That was in my mind. And I guess I did it for a few years. But then after a while, I decided, you know what? You know, I was reading the Bible and I, I was seeing some things. I was reading everything that I could possibly find to find out who God really is. And what I found out is that, and I told one of my chaplains this the other day, I said, you can't love unless you have God in your life. God is love. So I don't care if it's eros, I don't care if it's if it's if it's phileo or if it's agape. You can't love without having God in your heart. And once you have God in your heart, you can't help but to love. And when you do that, then you begin to extend outside of yourself. And the circumstances and the situations in which you find yourself are not the kinds of situations that hold you down. They literally become propellant to push you forward. Amen. And, and you know, and piggybacking on that, I, I'll never forget um, when I was at Love Gospel Assembly in the Bronx on 108th and the Grand Concourse. And Reverend um, Ron Bailey said to me, because I was with the youth group and, and we were sharing and, and something uh, with the young kids, uh, uh, somebody was preaching at them, not to them, but at yeah, them. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, young yeah. man, you know, your father in heaven. Your, your your father, he's going to look out for you. He's going to take care of you. And that kid just turned around, I don't have a father. My yeah. father abandoned yeah. me. And, and, and so we don't, if we don't know the root of what that individual is going through, whether they're a child, an older adult, or everything, we have to figure out what and why. Mm. What and why. And then help them help them and and that was such a learning experience another thing he mentioned because i'm a hugger 
And okay. and so I love hugging all the kids and everything. And he said, Ron, you have to be careful hugging the girls. Yeah. Because they've been raped. They've been abused. Yep. So I do a side hug. Yep. But again, a learning experience. Because, you know, to me, a hug, and, and uh, God bless my mom, and, you know, she was a hugger, my dad was a hugger, and so on, but we have to learn, and we cannot keep um, chastising. I, I was out the other day at, at, at a picnic with a sister in Christ, and she was criticizing her daughter because she doesn't accept the Lord, and this and that and that, and, and I heard the way she was going at it, and I said, where's the love? Mm. Where's the love? Yeah. That is Christ, was love. Yeah. So uh, there's, there's this big learning curve that, and if we're going to get our young people, and that's my, that's my goal, man, the young people, to get them back in church, to get them educated, to mm -hmm. get them to, to understand the importance of the education, the importance of a family, the importance of having God in their life, a mm -hmm. relationship with mm -hmm. God in their life. We have to figure out and do a better job. And, I totally and, agree with you. And how are we going to do this? Okay. And and a lot of us carry uh, 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 this this old way of of dealing with. Well, my my father, you know, he did it this way, or the church did it this way, or they did it this way. Mm. It's you know, some sometimes we need to change. Yes, sir. That's right. And I had to change. We and might, we change. might be the cog in the wheel that's, caught, that's stopping it from rolling. Yes, yes. So having programs like this and 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 the material that you're putting out, if if we truly read it, and then compare it with God's word, not just your word, not with Ronald Carson's word, not with their pastor's word, and that's another failure uh, in 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 the church that I see, and this is all me, is the fact that we don't, a lot of people don't go back when they hear what's coming from the pulpit, that person, word is final. Yeah. And so there's so much misconception taking place in the church because whether it's a Reverend Ike or, or a T Jake's or, or any of them, people accept their word. And not God's word. Mm. And we all have this way of retranslating. And, and in the college where I was teaching at, I always told my students, just don't pay attention to what I'm saying. I want you to do mm -hmm. all the three different resources. And then you make your final decision. Mm. But not just me. So, Well, you know, that's interesting because a lot of times you're absolutely right what we tend to do is we create small idols out of people, things and circumstances, situations, and that's what we begin to worship. We're not worshiping the God we're creating or we're worshiping the creation that he created. Um, and we some, somehow another attached and put a label on it and we worship that thing. Um, sometimes it's a material thing. Sometimes it is a, um, could be a teacher, you know, and we hug, we hug, and we hold on to, and that's that's our representation. Now, let me be quick to say that it's not so bad to have a good role model, but you have to look beyond the model to the creator of the model. Hey, amen. If don't if you don't, then when the model falls off the pedestal where you put it and breaks, it destroys your sense of what and who God is. So you can't do that, you know, you, you can admire people, you can learn from them, you should learn from them, but do not idle them. I think we, we sing a song in church, don't exalt the altar, don't exalt the pew, don't exalt the preacher, don't exalt the pew, preach the gospel full and free, and then men and women will gladly follow him who once taught, I'll draw all men unto me. Amen. Nothing better than that. Nothing greater than that. Nothing greater than that. So, you know, that's what I see. Um, that's what I see when I think about ministry. In fact, I preached today. I preached at the Baptist Ministers Conference. 
title of my sermon, I wrote an article about this a number of years ago, was the execution chamber. The execution chamber. And I argued in my sermon that the church is an execution chamber. Mm. And that eventually we need to have our own funeral to put away permanently that old person that we used to be, to execute the old person that we used to be. And at the same time, I said, it's, an, it's not only an execution chamber, but it's also an incubation chamber. So when you kill the old person, you incubate the new person. And as the Bible says, behold, all things become new. So let's bury the old guy. Let's bury the old girl. And let's come on and let's become the new creatures that Christ intended for us to be. Which means that whatever happens in life, the circumstances and the situations in which we find ourselves, we can now see them as they actually are. Not as obstacles, but as stepping stones. Amen. You know, you know, you talk about Patterson Projects. I know Patterson Project. Of course I do. I'm a South Bronx kid, right? Born in Harlem Hospital, raised in the Bronx. But 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 it's interesting because you know the old question was what good can come out of Patterson Projects? What good could come out of the South Bronx? What good could come out of you know any negative place in the world? And then you see a flower. A lily. Lilies grow in the mud. They grow in the swamps. They grow in the worst places in the world. And they're some of the most beautiful flowers that you'll ever find. So what can come out of it? They ask the same question of Jesus. What good can come out of Nazareth? Amen. And, and, and they looked and guess what they saw? They saw Jesus. They said, oh my Lord, look at this guy. He's, he, he's better than anything we've ever seen before. So let's kill him. <laughs> So let's kill him because, you know, he's just creating too many problems for us. He's telling us all the things that we can do, all the things that we can be. And, and, and what we need to do, we need to drop certain things and pick up other things. Well, we don't want to do that. We don't want to do that. Yeah, the circumstances that we live in sometimes are, Ron, you know this, they can be deplorable. But we, we fight to maintain them. We fight to maintain our position in the mud. I don't understand that. I, I mean, you know, I don't, I, I couldn't understand it when I was a child. And I don't understand it as an adult. How do we fight to hold on to something that's been detrimental to our existence from the time we were born? How do we do that? You, you, ignorance. And ignorance, not in terms of ignorance in terms of not truly understanding the other day we were talking about right the white gloves mm -hmm. right and 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 the characters in the baptist church a lot of the southern churches they wear the white gloves and if they understood the history behind the white gloves they would never wear those white gloves again mm -hmm. in the church but they don't so in, in that level of ignorance okay and we accept behaviors we accept this uh, you know as you were sharing that i you know, we, we have this vision of Christ, but do we really see Christ or do we see an individual? Mm. Do we see, a, a, you, you look at me, right? And people, you know, look, this person and, and who am I? I? I always say I am who the struggles my parents went through. Mm. All right? and, and that's, forget about the coloring of my skin or any of that other stuff. I am, and I represent my, the, our history. Mm. And, and I, you know, and people would say, Ron, but you could pass for white. Sure, I could do it. I could pass for anything. But that doesn't represent the struggles that we went through as human beings. The struggles Christ went through. The struggles all of, everybody has been through some struggles. And, our, and, and, and when I see our young people out here, and I hear these comments and everything, um, and I go, but do you know? Do you know? You know, the, the kids walking around, you know, with their butts hanging off. You mm. know, the, the, the pen. And I said, do you? Well, yeah, that's from the jail. I said, no, that's from the master taking the belt away so they can't run away from the plantation. Mm. 
But we have to be it's deeper than the prison. Yes. So how do we we how do we educate? And we have to educate kids in different ways. Okay. And we one thing when I walk in the classroom, I said this is an exchange of information. I'm this age and you're the age. I don't understand everything you've been through in life. I don't understand your, your the culture now. I don't understand your music. You got to teach me. And I'm going to teach you through my experiences and what I've learned. And we're going to share information. And I think the church is a place where sharing should take place as well. Mm -hmm. It shouldn't just be one person or several people making this determination on a congregation. This is the way it is. And I, and, I, and again, we need to have more Bible study. We need to have more training. We need to know who's in that class. Who's teaching what? Mm. All right. And and so the history of the Bible is really important. And, you know, it's just, it's unbelievable. In the last, I've been serving the Lord for what, 30 years since 1986. Mm -hmm. And I've had my ups and downs. I've messed up royally at times. Okay. And I've learned from those mistakes. And I said, do I really ever want to go through that again in my life? Do I want that person over there, the kids and all? So I share that information with them. I let them know, hey, you know, I did mess up. I did do this and I did do that. You know, they don't have to know the depth of it, but they have to understand the pain behind it and the, what I've learned from it. And, and so what are we learning from God's word? When we, when we read, you know, I, I was listening to a lecture uh, yesterday uh, on the on the tearing when Christ died and 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 the the tearing of the 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 right. curtains in the temple and what does that really represent? And I had no and idea it represented the old and the new testament and the separation and and of course him you know taking on all our sin and everything. We all can continue to learn and we need to continue learning. I'm still taking classes. I'm still learning it. And I love learning, and I thought I never would. And so, but learning is not just about me; it's right. so I can pass it on. Right, right. He who, if you if you can't teach what you know, you really don't know it. Wow, you've got to be able to teach it. Um, I, I'm real big on teaching. I'm real big on sharing. I'm real big on um, imparting wisdom. You know, one of the things I've learned over the years, Ron, you. And one of the things that I, that I said in, in reading your, um, your, your, your bio is that one of the things that you're most proud of are your two daughters. Oh. That you were able to share with them and both graduated from Ivy League colleges, which is a wonderful thing. See, but the legacy, the legacy is not the colleges. It's you. It's you. You know, it, it's you and their mother. Um, no matter what happens in the relationship, it's you and their mother. I, I've learned that you can leave a legacy even if you have no children. And if you have no children, you have a bigger obligation to leave a legacy because you have no one to carry that name into the next generation. So it's only about the legacy that you leave. So I know that because I'm that I'm that guy. I'm that guy. So yeah. I have no children. So the legacy that I leave will be the legacy that I've left in the people that I've touched in the course of my life. So with that thought in mind, everybody touches people in the course of their life. They do not have to be your blood relative, but you're going to leave an impression. Question is, what kind of impression will you leave? Amen. Right? And will it last or will it just be a fading memory that just essentially eventually and ultimately just vanishes away and and, and 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 you know it's nice when it's someone in your family like i think about my dad my dad's birthday was the day uh after my installation and i and i had a chance to share that with those who were there which is a wonderful thing i mean I, I, my heart was moved and i know he would have been proud but it wasn't his birthday that most that that I remember most is those little things that he told me during his short stay on life in life as long as I was, you know, I was only 20 years old, but he dropped some major pearls in my life. 
you know, he told me, and I'll always remember, he said, um, you know, he would say, like, anybody could do that when I do something stupid, you know. He said, anybody could do that. <laughs> and I had to think about, what do you mean anybody could do it? He said, anybody could. Doesn't take much to do that. So he was really asking me in his own way, how can you rise above mediocre? Because anybody could do that. How do you rise above being just okay? Because anybody can do that. How do you rise to your highest level of expectation for yourself and not get caught up in the humdrum of life and get swallowed up in the vicissitudes of life? How do you do that? So he challenged me. So as I grew, I grew older, well, he was no longer there to talk to me. So all of those things that he's, he planted in my spirit, now they keep popping up. They keep popping up. And they're, they're producing flowers and stuff like that. And trees are growing. And, and, and it's all because of the stuff that he planted in me. My, my mother, my mother planted little seeds and, and, and they begin to blossom. So I think about that and say, you know what? I do not have to be a father, a biological father. To, to implant or to plant seeds in people's lives that will impact them positively for the rest of them. Yeah, no. amen. <laughs> I, I, if I can share with you one thing um, that really touched me is my students coming up to me and saying, hey, Mr. Carson, you really care about us, don't you? Mm -hmm. How could you ask? I mean, that brings tears to my eyes mm. and recognize, and that's the love of Christ, okay, coming out of me. I don't have to preach at them. Any, the and, and my kids, you know, students still reach out to me. I think I mentioned the students showed up at my mother's funeral. Students reach out to me, hey, sending mm. me pictures of their kids. Hey, and so I don't have any grandkids, but they said, you do have grandkids. There you go. And 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 you talk about people that touch your life. We yeah. I Saturday was down in Central Park and checking out pickleball. Okay, and mm. I ran into one of my buddies down there, and we started reminiscing about the parky. Because remember, they used to call them parkies back at the yep, park. Yep. Yep. Right. Miss, right. Mr. McGee and Harold and Miss White and how they touched our lives. You know, they were just. They worked at the, or Mr. Bonnamy or the music teacher or, you know, whoever. They're, these are people. And, I, and, and my ninth grade teacher, I'll never forget Mr. B uh, Mr. Denver, sir, when my father died, how he embraced me. Mm -hmm. he, he, you know, he didn't say, well, kid, get over it. He hugged me. He, he cared about me. And, and, and I think all that, came, that, that, that meant and carried through to I'm 75 years old. And I still remember those times in my life, how those people showed love. My when my father died, the, the church was packed. Mm. And, and and this is with you. And they were hey Carson, they called me Carson. I never was wrong. Hey man, your father, your father. So he touched our lives. And a lot of those young people didn't have a dad. Mm. And and so on and and how how did that that means so much? So you touch my life, mm. boy. I met you what six months ago, man. Yeah, and it hasn't even been six months, has it? I have, well, March, right? March. So yeah, it hasn't been right. Yeah. Four months ago. Is it four months? And four months I, is I, I said I'm more part of this guy. I, I I mean, as I read your materials and and and. Yeah, I, I, I admire you, man. I, you know, I said, do I have to wear a tie tonight? Because you always <laughs> got a suit and tie on. And and but you you exemplify, you exemplify a, a, a caring and loving and educated person. And I think that's beautiful. And and how do we bring that to the next individual out here, the, the young people? I, I'm I, it, we we need to. They need to, and they need to know that you came from Nip, what, I don't know, Prospect Avenue or a previous Boston Street. Road. Boston yeah. Road. Boston Road. You know, that, that like you said, out of, out of the ghetto, good. I remember Pastor Kaufman always said that, you know, the flowers and, and roses and stuff come out of the ghetto, okay, if they want to call it the ghetto. 
Mm -hmm. I, and, and, but we have to show these young people. We're writing a book now on all the, the guys. I found out one of the, one of the fellows that grew up in the projects. He was, he was the psychologist for the New York Yankees. Hmm. And another brother went to not only Harvard, but M MIT. Hmm. And, and I'm not bragging, but I'm saying, Dad, if the kids could know that, yeah, so what? Let's overcome. Let, there's different ways of climbing that mountain, and we have to teach them how to climb that mountain, and and show them there's opportunity. We have to show them. We have to give them the tools. Okay, we can't say, well, this is there. No, I, you know, I'm, I'm a young lady in in the gym where I work out. She just finished up at Pace University studying law. I said, hey, why don't you go write a letter to Sotomayor? who grew up in the projects, uh, I don't know if the Sound Blue Project, the Branch River Project, yeah, the Justice. Sound yeah, Blue. and, and I, as a single mom, why don't you, she said, can I do that? I said, why can't you do it? The most she can do is say no. And then I'm reaching out to various judges. Yes, I met a judge the other day. And I said, okay, he's on the list because I wanted to interview judges. I wanted to, I wanted to climb that mountain. And but we got to give them the tools to climb. But we got to show them how to climb the mountain. You know, you said something that's interesting. Um, I just read this again today. It says, um, you know, there are mountains in everyone's life. I'm paraphrasing. Yeah. Uh, our our job is not to climb to the top of the mountain, but to find our path. Because you may not get to the top of the mountain, but if you find your path, you will. Find find everything that you need along that path don't follow somebody else's path find your path because everyone has a different path in life that they must follow and you have to find yours uh if not and 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 you said something else i was and and when you said it it kind of dawned on me all flowers grow in the dirt <laughs> all <laughs> All of them, unless they take them out and put them in water and they grow in the water, right? But flowers, trees grow in the dirt. They grow out of the, they grow out of the uh, if you will, the, you know, the, the, the dung, because, you know, dung fertilizes the dirt. Amen. Amen. And you get all kinds of beautiful things coming out of it. Hey, listen, you know what I'm going to do? We're at the top of the hour. So I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna go back. I'm I'm gonna banish for a minute, and you can do likewise. You can you can stop your video. Just push just push your video. It says stop video, and it'll stop your video for a moment. I'm just gonna disappear for a minute, and I'm gonna go back, and I'm going to share my screen. And then what we're going to do is I'm going to go back and recognize my sponsors and advertisers. I'm gonna read the article again. Uh, I'm going to ask the challenge question again, and I'm going to. Uh, then bring in some of the comments that some of our viewers are making so that they can join us in conversation. All right. So said that we're going to go ahead and do this. Don't forget to support our advertisers and our sponsors, the JLR Company and J. Lauren Russell Consulting LLC for all of your church financial consulting needs. Check out our website, www.jlorenrusselconsulting.com. That's www.jlaurenrussellconsulting.com or simply give us a call, 718-328-8096, 718-328-8096. If you want to train your trustees, if you want to develop your property, if you need a church loan, give us a call. We'll be there to help. Matters of Faith, the book, can be purchased at my cash app, dollar sign Matters of Faith. The cost of the book is $22.80. That's $22.80. You can send your check of money order to the JLR Company, Post Office Box 301, New York, New York, 10035. That's Post Office Box 301, New York, New York, 10035. Get the book. It will absolutely bless your life. You can also get it as an ebook. All you need to do is go to www.smashwords.com backslash books backslash view backslash 993-177. That's www.smashwords.com backslash books backslash view backslash 993-177. The book has no shipping and handling if you get it as an ebook. And also check out the Eat Okra app for all black owned restaurants all over the nation. That's right. Eat Okra. Wow. 
And finally, subscribe, like, and share our Matters of Faith YouTube channel. Make sure that you subscribe, like, and share our Matters of Faith YouTube channel. Let me add just one more thing. Get your subscription to Better Mag Magazine today. A two-year subscription is only $27.50. That's www.abettermag.com, www.abettermag.com. I want to take a minute just to thank everyone for their support and encouragement in the installation of yours truly as the district governor of District 7230 of Rotary on last Wednesday. For those of you who attended, I really appreciate it. I can't thank you enough. But for those of you who had not, I want to share with you my remarks so that you'll know what I said and how much I appreciated this honor. This has been an interesting journey, and um, I never had any intention of being a district governor of Rotary International. In fact, I'll tell you the God's honest truth. When I was first asked to go to a Rotary meeting from my boss, um, I asked him, what was Rotary? He said, you don't know what Rotary is? I said, can I be transparent and clear? Can I tell you the truth? He said, yes. I said, I thought it was a part of the Ku Klux Klan. Because <laughs> nobody that I've ever known has been in the Rotary, and nobody's ever talked about it in my lifetime, and I'm not a young child. I was in my 40s. And we laughed about it. He said, no, that's not what it is. And he began to explain to me that it's a literally a service club that allows you to serve needy humanity from your own place of residence, but it can extend throughout the world. And I said, sure, I'd go. And I went to this club. It was a Yonkers club. There were two clubs at the time. And when I got there, there was a woman by the name of Vera DeMarco. I'll never forget her. She was the first woman president that that club had. And it's then maybe, how many years was it? I want to say 87 years. The first woman president. And I enjoyed her because she had to make a place for herself as the president of that club. And so we bonded. I was the youngest guy there. Wasn't the only black person, but I was the youngest guy there. And so it became, for me, a place that I went back to and I began to understand that you can make a difference in the lives of others in this thing called Rotary. And so I got involved. And about maybe four, two, three years later, I became the president. For the first time. I was president three times. <laughs> but now I'm the district governor. And I say that because I want you to think about in front of you you have in front of you you have a program. And that program has more about Rotary than it does about me, because it's not about me, it's about we. How do we work together to make a difference in the communities that we live in? And you can do it right here in your own backyard, but yet you can impact people around the world. Isn't that amazing? That you can do a little, you can take a little bit, the little bit that you have and add it to what other people have and impact the world and make a difference in the lives of people that you will never, ever meet. They'll never know that it was you. But you wake up in the morning knowing that you did something that made a difference in the lives of people that you will never meet. That to me, is worth more than the challenges that, that I may face going forward. And so I invite you, and, I, and today is special because today is July 12th. Tomorrow would have been my father's birthday. My father passed away when I was 20 years old. The last birthday that he had, he was sick and in the hospital with cancer. And his birthday occurred, for them, some of you who have been around a while, remember the blackout of 1977? Yeah. Well, that was his birthday. And that was the first time I did not go to see him in the hospital because I did not want to see him like that on his birthday. And all the lights went out. That was the last birthday he had. And so from the time, all of my adult life, I've been without parents. My, my mom died. Uh, five years before my dad did. So all of my life has been about 
learning to live in community and society without having the backdrop of a parent or an undergirding of a parent or a safety net of a parent because if you did something wrong and you messed up, there was no one there to catch you. I don't know if you've ever experienced that before. But Rotary has shown me that you don't have to be blood related to have a safety net. And when you do something good for other people, you know, that could have been me that could have benefited from that service that they were providing. So why not do it for somebody else? So that they won't miss what I did because there was no one there to do it for me. Why not bring Rotary into a community that never knew of Rotary before and let them have an opportunity to serve humanity, needy humanity, right in their own backyard and make a difference around the world. You know, the pebble that goes into the, the, the ripple has an impact on the entire lake. That's what I want to challenge you with today. I want to challenge you to look beyond the confines of your own community, to look above yourself. The number one theme in Rotary is service above self. What are you doing to make a difference in the lives of others? And here's another one. If you do something good for someone and they find out that it's you, it doesn't count. You got to do it again. So let me say it again. I want you to hear this. If you do something good for someone and they find out that it was you, it doesn't count. You got to do it again. That's success, by the way. Success is doing the same thing that you did before that was successful over and over and over again because it's the right thing to do. So I challenge you all to let your light so shine that others may see the glory that you have in you and that you'll make a difference in the lives of people around you and beyond your reach that you'll never get to know. God bless you. I love you. And there's nothing you can do about it. So get <laughs> the article one of the greatest lessons to learn that article can be found in my column matters of faith at the bronx chronicle www.thebronxchronicle.com yonkers insider www.yonkersinsider.blogspot.com better mag magazine www.abettermag.com and black westchester magazine as well as pamela's big heart newsletter one of the greatest lessons to learn Philippians chapter 4, verses 8 through 13, New King James Version. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. The things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do, and the God of peace will be with you. But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at last, your care for me has flourished again, though you surely did care, but you lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be abased, and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. One of the greatest lessons to learn. What will it take for you to be content, to live in a state of happiness and satisfaction? I guess the answer to that question depends on your worldview. Some live in a fantasy world where they think winning the lottery would do just fine. Others fantasize about climbing the corporate ladder or getting a big raise. Still others think the right man or the right woman will bring them the contentment they crave. Maybe moving into a new neighborhood or the house of their dreams, the size and scope of your definition of contentment will depend on how you view the world. Paul puts forth a different perspective because his view was shaped by his sky view. He was no longer 
basing his contentment on earthly creature comforts, but on things that were inspired by God. Paul said, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue and if there is anything praiseworthy, he went on to say that it wasn't the material things the Philippians shared with him that brought him a sense of contentment, although he appreciated every gift. Paul says the things that were given to him were nice, but he learned one of his greatest lessons when he learned how to be content in whatever state he was in. It didn't matter if he had material things or not, prosperous or in need, hungry or full, in agony or ecstasy. Paul learned how to be content in any and every situation. He learned from his sky view what, that whatever he needed to do, wanted to do, had to do, he could do through Christ who strengthens him. In verse 9, Paul tells his readers the things which he learned and received and heard and saw in me. These do, and the God of peace will be with you. That's before he tells them about one of the greatest lessons he ever learned in verse 11. I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. If we, as readers of this letter to the Philippian church, follow the example Paul gave, we will be able to proudly proclaim that we have also learned one of the greatest lessons that was taught. Be content with whatever state you are in. Be blessed. Now here's my question again tonight. I want you to think about this because I really want you to respond. What will it take for you to be content with what you have? To live in a state of happiness and satisfaction no matter your circumstance or your situation? Let me ask it one more time. What will it take for you to be content with what you have to live in a state of happiness and satisfaction, no matter your situation or circumstance. Wow. Wow. I already told you something about him. You've met him and you've learned some other things about him. About <laughs> dynamic man, awesome man of God. And the picture that you see is why he's so blessed. His two daughters. My hmm. brothers and my sisters, Matters of Faith family, would you welcome with me again for the second half of the show, Chaplain Ron Carson. Well, there you go. There you go. I'm going to leave that up for just a minute so everybody can see your beautiful daughters. <laughs> oh, man. Did yeah. a little research. <laughs> yeah, you did your homework. And I thought I took that picture down. But that was Father's Day. Okay. That was Father's Day, man, about 10 years ago. Okay. And I'm so happy to be with my daughters. Um, and, 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 and like you have there, I was blessed, you know, as, as I was listening to, to, as you were sharing about the Rotary Club, remember at, at the onset of our conversation, the ignorance and, and how we perceive things and the Rotary Club or the Knights of Columbus, I, I saw it the same way as you did. Okay. Not necessarily the KKK. But as a white organization, I, I was had a conversation with somebody yesterday. If you were talking about um, playing tennis or golf, and and back in the day, I, we realized we weren't exposed to it, or we didn't have the economics right to to do it, and and how it can be taken out of context. And that, uh, as a mature man, I we can't, I came to realize what no, it, it wasn't because we were being discriminated against it's just we weren't exposed to it and we didn't have the economics to indulge in that type of um sport and whatever it happens to be i mean you know i came up and i was going to be a professional basketball player you know mm -hmm. kareem and i and tiny and all of us played ball together mm -hmm. and nobody told me about bum knees <laughs> So and that so that's where ignorance comes into play, Be, and and that's where we're responsible to make sure that our young people, uh, and our elderly as well, okay, don't put out um, the wrong information. Right. right. All right. And right. and and we have this. You know, I hear. So we see these pictures of Christ, blonde hair, blue eyes, and and I hear well you know this and that it doesn't make any difference what he looked like it's what his heart was all about and i had to come to that conclusion all right 
who is this man and what was he all, all about? So, so yeah, the artists, the Italian artists, you know, Leonardo da Vinci and all, they, the, you know, purity meant blonde hair, blue eyes and whiteness. And so we, I had to put that behind me, okay? And, and we all know the, the real deal, all right? So um, for me, you, 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 the, the Rotary Club and, and why it, what it, the hook was the joy of helping others. And, and I didn't share much about, you know, the fact that I was involved with World Vision mm -hmm. and, and volunteering mm. was the most enjoyable thing that I've done in my life. And my daughters learned from it. And I can give them, nothing, all the credit I can give them is they learn how to go out there and give of themselves. Mm. I, I, that, man, that, wow. That's such a beautiful thing when we can get out there and go to the old neighborhood and help out and do something. I, I'm painting homes or giving out clothes or giving out food or, or or just giving somebody a hug. That's such a rewarding feeling for me. Right, 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 right. And so, and and I, I love this expression, we are blessed to bless. Mm. You know? And we have to remember we are blessed to bless. God gave, has given us skill sets, whether the, whether you're cleaning a building or sweeping a floor, and I've done it all, okay, you know, um, it, those are skills and mm -hmm. opportunities to take and develop that. I always tell my students, here we go back to the students, you know, one student came in and he say, hey, Mr. C, but all I do is clean a building. I said, you know how to clean a building? That means that one, one of these days, maybe you'll be able to run the building. And maybe you own your own cleaning business. And they said, we never thought about that. Or the person that works at the little store. I said, you have people skills. Take those. But we, I had to explain to them. I had to, you know, enlighten them right, to take right, that right. skill set. You know, and I said, I worked in Kentucky Fried Chicken. I worked at Alexander's. I worked in the gas station pump gas. I carry people's grocery. And, and that's all part of who I am. And people have to also know that we did that, those kind of things. There's just not an oddity in life. You know, and, 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 and you know, yeah, I took my two cents bottles and my five cents bottles to have a little money. And you know what the greatest reward was? Buying my mom a gift, buying my dad a gift, not buying for myself. It was doing and, or doing for somebody else. I, and, and we all have to understand that. So our reward could be educating somebody in so many different areas and helping them out, not just talking about it. Talk is cheap. Let's let's do something. So the Rotary Club is doing something. I heard about the money that you guys raised and I went, wow. And the fact, you know, that I already got some, I'm looking at some places where, hey, the Rotary can help out here and it can help. And, you know, I, I went into that mindset already. What can we do? What can you guys do? And, and to make life better. And, and maybe we need to build some schools or have to after school programs. But where's the money coming? Because, you know, the city's not doing anything. The lottery was designed for what purpose? Education. Mm -hmm. It ain't happening. OK. And so many of these other things that just not happen. So we have to be the, 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 the point guard. We have to be and we have to do things. Um, that will benefit individuals inside and outside the church. The church is just four walls. The church is in our hearts. The church is doing. Christ didn't live, it, it, he didn't go from church building the building. He was out there amongst the people. And he didn't care what color they were, what clothing they wore, whether they stunk or they this or this or that. And he didn't care if they were Jew or Muslim or anybody. He, what was he all about? Love and education, because he was called what? Rabbi, teacher. That's right. And he went out there and he taught. And he didn't walk by anybody and, and you know, it, oh, he stopped and he helped. Did what he could. And he grabbed general people, you know, his, his, the, his followers. They, they weren't rabbis or this or that. I mean, yeah, Luke was a, a doctor, uh, but he took people like you and me 
and whoever's listening, and he built on them. And that's what the church needs to do also. We need to build on and develop skills so we can get out there. Because you know what? A lot of people don't, the, the, all the Ivy League schools, schools started as Christian colleges. Harvard was Christian. All of them were Christian schools. And now, what's going on out here? And when I tell my students that, they go, they were? I says, yeah, but we've lost the connection. How we bring that back? If we wouldn't have a need for welfare and all the social things, if we were building a housing as a church, if we were supplying the needs of the community, the church should be taking care of the community. The community shouldn't be taking care of the church the way I see it. And this is Ronald Carson speaking. All right. We don't need $16 million for a plane. We need $16 million for that building that needs to go up or that school to get to, or that after school program or that bus that can transport those kids back and forth to church or the after school program. So we can put violins and musical instruments and take them to see things. Some of the kids have never been out of their neighborhood. It's amazing. And, and I was so blessed to have a mother that I don't know how she managed with five kids to get us down to, to Radio City at five o'clock or seven o'clock in the morning during Easter or take us here and there to the museum. When we get on the train, here come the Carson kids, hmm. you know, and look at you, you know, you talk about your dad, what he touched you. I, I, I anyways, I, I just think oh, this. So let, let me let me let me drop in. I want I want to I want to see if I can do something here because one of the things I'm hearing is that you know I hear the passion for sure, but one of the other things I'm I'm hearing very clearly is that um, if you're not contented with where you are with what you have, you cannot move forward into what you can be. So when you talk about your mom getting you downtown to Radio City at five o'clock in the morning and the four other brothers and sisters that you had going with you, um, you know, that that's that's a, a sign that, you know what, we, we, we don't have a lot, but we'll be there at five o'clock in the morning so that we can share what's available to them. I may not have it in my copers, but we can get to it over here. I can use somebody else's resources so that my family can be blessed so they can understand, they can know, and then they can begin to grow. So I look at it, and, and this way, Ron, I look at it is take the resources that are available to you, whether you have them for yourself or whether you get them from someone else, and use them to be a blessing to other people. And by that, you are content with what you have because what you have may not be the material wealth or the possessions, but the access. If you have access, then that means that you have if you're content with that, then you can utilize whatever's available to you. But if you're not content with what you have, then what's around you, you can't even access it because you're always looking at something else and never appreciating what you have. Does that mm. make sense? Yeah, I hear you. So, yeah. so, so, so you must be, you must have an appreciation for what you have in order for you to get other things in order for you to use to be a blessing to other people. Because it's not about you, never has been about you. It's always about others, what you do for others. Jesus said it himself, you know, says, um, you know, Jesus talked a lot about doing for others as you would have them do unto you. And so many different ways did he say that, because it's important that we get to the point that we stop looking at what's in it for me and understand that when you begin to serve others, all of your needs will be supplied according to the Lord's riches and glory, because he'll take care of you. That's Amen. his promise. And that was a commitment long time ago, long time ago. And it doesn't stop. So by the way, Daryl said, he says, I think it's wrong to assume that an unsaved person does not have an intrinsic self-destructive nature inside of him or her. Remember those pigs that ran off the cliff as soon as those demons entered in? They obeyed the influence of the demons which was to destroy themselves. Demons want people to destroy themselves. That's their job, to get people to do that. That's to kill themselves. People need Christ to live. People need Christ to live. I like that. I like that. I really do. And Gloria said, 
contentment. I realize that God has given me, even in my present situation, everything I need to endure, grow closer to him, and remain victorious in my relationships with him, and he will supply all my needs. Then she said, amen. So they're responding to that question that I put on the table. You know, what, what is it that we need to do? Uh, uh, and specifically, what will it take for you? And I made it personal to be content with what you have, live in a state of happiness and satisfaction, no matter your status or your station or situation or circumstance. What's it going to take? For you, not for somebody else, but for you. And so Gloria says, I've learned that whatever state I am, there was to be content, which I like that as a re repetition of Paul. And so let me see, there was another one that I wanted to share with you. Daryl, Daryl said again, and my, 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 my pointer needs to be charged up because it's not, my, 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 my mouse is not acting properly. Act, act like I got a cold or something. Not functioning <laughs> properly. Let me see if I can get it this way. Only problem is I can't bring it down for some reason. Let's see. Oops, didn't want to do that. Okay. So y'all bear with me. I'm just trying to get the point of the work. Uh, let me see if I can do it this way. Yeah, that's why I say go to the mat. There we go. Um, so I saw a friend of mine yesterday, I hadn't seen her in a while, and she said she would be on tonight. She kept her word. She says, praise the Lord. Good evening, Reverend Dr. J. Lauren Russell. Although it was the homegoing service of our beloved pastor, Reverend Dr. James B. Barnwell III, sleep in peace. May God continue to provide his wife, family, and family, friends, and affiliates with blessings. We will miss him. Um, so I'm, however, Dr. Russell, it was good to see you face to face again. Yes. I told you I would be on tonight and you kept your word. So Daryl says, I think it's wrong to assume that as I served, I did that one already. And then um, let me see. He said, I can only answer the challenge question for today by lifting my eyes unto the hills from which comes my strength. My help comes from the Lord. I can't do this thing without Jesus. He says, none of it. Life here is a mystery. The truth of it is anyway no let me read that again life here is a mystery the truth of it is anyway and listening to god is where those mysteries are unpacked for me and explained to me so that i can be at peace with and content in the midst of a very complicated world really and then gloria says gloria they're making comments i like this Without my mother or father who went home to be with the Lord at an early age or early time in my life, I thank God one day I learned about my heavenly father. And, and, and Brenda says, nice Father's Day photo of Chaplain Professor, that's you and your daughter. Yes, you are blessed too. So here's what I wanted to say. This is something that kind of crossed my mind too, as I was thinking about how the Lord gets you contented. I have two brothers and a sister. My eldest brother passed away. But when we were growing up, you know, we were competitive and we used to compete against each other and all that kind of stuff, beat up each other the whole nine yards. Well, I used to get beat up because I was like the youngest kid, youngest boy. But it was interesting that after my parents died, I just thought about this the other day. My parents died. I was always trying to sort of follow in my brother's footsteps, you know, because they had reputations. They were bad kids in the block and that kind of thing and the school and all of that. So whenever I walked into the room, they were like, oh, you another Russell kid? Oh, my God. They would just back up, you know. So to a large degree, I had to live up to this reputation that they had established, right? Um, I wasn't necessarily a bad kid, but because I had the reputation my family reputation, I kind of had to live up to that bad image, right? Now, I was a good kid. I was a good student. But I still had that, that, that rough side of me that had to be maintained. But when my parents died, and I was on my own, I no longer had to live up to anybody's expectations. 
I didn't have to live up to my mother's expectations. I always said I was buying them a house. My dad was gone, my mother was gone. I didn't have to buy them a house. I didn't have to live up to my brother's reputation in the community. All I had to concern myself was with what the Lord wanted me to do. I looked out for my sister, but my concern was now the reputation or the legacy or the life that I was going to build for myself. And so I had to get content with who I was. Not trying to figure out who my brothers were not trying to emulate their actions, but who am I? Who is God trying to make me into? And that's when I started to actually get content and began to grow as an individual and as a, as a man of God. I began to embrace, embrace what the Lord was putting in front of me and then getting content with whatever and wherever he placed me because I wasn't content before. You know, I wanted to be more or something else. But once I began to understand who I was and what God was placing before me and started appreciating those things, then the growth and development started to come. Now, it didn't come all at once. It still hasn't come all at once. It's still, still piecemealing. But man, when I look back over my life and I see what he's provided for me that I could not do for myself. As that old songwriter says, my soul cries out, hallelujah. And I'm contented with what I have. If my life ended today, I would be content because I did the best I could with what the Lord gave me to work with. That's the thing that I get excited about. I'm doing the best I can with what the Lord gave me to work with. Okay, I'm gonna kick it back over to your court, Ron. I'm gonna put it back on your into your court, Carson. <laughs> I just that that was deep. Uh, as we and, and you know, uh, as I listened, uh, that's very difficult to be content because society. We turn on the boob tube. We turn on uh, Facebook and all this stuff, and and we hear about the three million, $300 million that this one's making or the 200 million, you know, this and all this kind of stuff. And, and we have to absorb this stuff because it's slapped in our faces daily. And, and I'm going, you know, even with me, but the Lord has shown me to be content. And my, you know how my contentment's gonna come? And, and, and again, going back to the school, when I can give scholarships to kids. Mm make money so I can pass the I the pleasure in, in school was being able to buy a student a computer mm. to get them out to eat mm. or to, to tell them you know that somebody cares about them. I remember one student that took her out, I invited her out, she calls me her, her special dad and we were out and it was winter time and she comes out in, in, in a sweater and sandals. I'm going girl and and you know, I said, what? We were going to go out to eat. So right. I took her to buy her clothes. Right. And, and she, to this day, that's what, 10 years ago, she she lives up, wherever she, hey, special dad, how you doing? And and those little things make such an impact, you know, on our lives. And me going, when I did missionary work, that's that was a trigger, man. When I went down to Peru and South America, and mm. these people living in garbage dumps. And the kids were playing a bunch of vultures and stuff, and, and you could smell the odor from 10 miles away. Mm. And, and yet they were content. And when the, the, the they brought the word in and, and they were content when I just we, we get I bought ice cream for everybody, you know? And and I and, and, and just when are we going to be happy with who we are and see beyond our personal needs? Okay. And 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 how can we impact lives out here and, and help that person out on this instead of criticizing them? Yeah, you know, I'm not happy with a lot of things I see, but how can I bring about change? Mm -hmm. God gives us the tool. And you know, and, and again, when we hear uh people using 
theological terms or, or reading the Bible, what does that really translate to? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good question. Good question. Is it, you know, I, I, I think about what's going on now and, and what happened in, you know, the women during the, the, in Rome, in the Roman era, when they were going into the arenas to fight and dressing like men. And, and so this is, now it's happening again, or, or the Church of Corinth and Fordham Road, to me, is always here now that is Corinth and, and, and mm -hmm. seeing the, what's going on in there. How, how do we get these young people to understand the Bible talks about this. It talks about it. But if, if, if we're using these, and I'll use generic biblical terms, if we keep doing that, we're not going to bridge the gap. So how do we, we have to be able to bridge that gap and let them know, okay, this is what, this is what Paul was speaking about. This is what Christ was speaking about. This is what he would, this and this, but we have to put it in such terms, you know, oh, you need to know this. You should know. No, let's teach them. Mm. Let's teach them. Okay, let's show them. All right, pick them up, take them into Corinthia. So take them into an area, you know, where where, 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 where they're living the life of, of sin. And what is sin? We love to say you're a sinner. Well, what is a sinner? Okay. And I'm, what does this say? Faith is not a religion. It's the fuel of Christian life. And religion had, and, and again, religion has created division. There was some stuff I was reading and I said, oh my God, mm. we have, and you know, when I mentioned earlier about all the denominations, I, my, my prayer is that all the churches, I don't care if you're Catholic or Lutheran or Muslim or whatever, when are we going to come together and stop the destruction that's going, I was at, at a restaurant the other day, a Muslim brother, and we, we were just laughing and talking. He says, brother, call me brother. He didn't call me Christian because I, I had a cross on my collar. He says, what's happening to our world? It's dying. It's dying. He didn't blame on the Republicans, the Democrats, or anybody. He said, what are we going to do? Our world is dying. And it, it's coming to fruition. We, we're seeing things out here. So what, what, what is our responsibility? And first of all is, is to, to embrace our young people and teach them God's word in such a way that's applicable for their lives now, not 2000. Not, and, and not just the young people. We well, yeah. All people. Yeah, all people. Yeah. Well, you know, that's where my heart is, okay? I know, I know, I know. Well, you know, you said something. I, I just wanted to share this with you because you you said you you said denomination, and I wrote it down because I wanted to to share with you what what what, what um, Fred Sampson, pastor in Detroit, said many years ago. I, I I haven't recorded. He said he used these phrases, these this phrase, and you, you'll never forget it when I tell it to you. He said three things. He said denominational limitations. Ecclesiastical apartheid and petty people trying to run profound purpose. Denominational limitations, ecclesiastical apartheid, and petty people trying to run profound purposes is the bane of the church because we're we're you know we're 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 looking at who we are, what our denominational affiliations are, what our ecclesiastical um, uh, theology is. And we've got a lot of people in leadership positions who have no business being in leadership positions because they're leading people down the road to perdition. And for those of you who don't know, perdition is another word for hell. They're just leading them straight to hell because they sound good. They might look good. They might have nice rhythm, but denominational limitations, ecclesiastical apartheid, and petty people trying to run profound purposes. If we don't get around that, we don't get around those things, 
you know, my, my business, the JLR company, J Law and R Consulting LLC, you know what my, 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 my slogan is? It's not about the castle. It's about the kingdom. Mm. It's not about the castle. It's about the kingdom. I'm not building castles and I do, I do lending, but I asked pastor, I said, listen, what, what are you building? What are you purchasing it for? What's your purpose? And if the purpose doesn't make sense, if it's not about kingdom building, if it's about, you know, building your ego, I'm not doing it. Amen. Find somebody else because anybody could do that. So my dad told me anybody could do that. But let's go beyond the mediocre. Let's do kingdom building. Let's reach people where they are with the gospel and do it any way you can. Stop limiting your access. Stop limiting the message. Be like a be like a mail person, you know, that delivers the mail. Just deliver the mail. What do you care how the package looks? Your job is to deliver the message. Just deliver the message. People will get it. I, I, you know, I told, I told church today, I, I looked at the numbers. You know, I like numbers. Looked at the numbers. Um, I told them the, we have, I think we get, there's 31,000 plus, 31 million plus seconds in a year, everyone gets in a year, right? And then it takes about three minutes to share the gospel on average. I looked at that and said, every person, if they, not counting the time that you eat, sleep, and recreate, you can, sir, you can share the message, the gospel of Jesus Christ. What's the number I looked at? Hold on for a second. You can five, uh, 3,000 and some odd peak times a year that you could do it. I ripped the thing up. But, but you can do that. 3,000 plus times a year. Now, interestingly enough, 73 has the 73,000. That's what the number is, 73,000. But think about this. If, 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 if everybody just shared the good news with somebody as often as they could, there should not be a building or an assembly that's not overflowing with people if we simply do what we've been asked to do, which is go. So you won't go though, if you're not content with what you have. If you're trying to get what somebody else got, now you're, you're lusting, you're fiending. That's the word they use today, right? You're fiending for something else that you don't have. Um, the Bible calls it covetousness. You're coveting what you don't have, looking for other people, looking at other people's stuff, wanting to have it yourself. That's covetousness. That's a sin. That, that's a sin. That's missing the mark. The mark says you love them. You rejoice with those who rejoice and you weep with those who weep. If somebody is successful, rejoice with them. If they're doing well, rejoice with them. Don't covet what they have. That's what they have. That's what the Lord had for them. That's not what he has for you. That's why you're not content. Because you're looking at somebody else's stuff and you're saying, well, how come I don't have it? Well, you have what you have. If you appreciate what you have, he can add to it. But if you don't appreciate what you have, he won't add to it because what would you do it? What would you do if you got more? The same thing you do with what you have now. Nothing. Nothing. Nobody's going to give you anything if you don't use it properly. You know the story in the Bible about the three men who all received the talent? One buried it in the dirt. The other two went and invested it. And all of them had a response from their master when he came back. The one who had the 10 talents multiplied it. The one who had five talents multiplied it. The one he gave one talent buried it in the dirt. The one who had the one talent, he took it away and gave it to the one with the 10. And he cast him out into utter darkness because he did not take care of, he didn't appreciate what he had. Appreciate what you have. Find contentment in what you have and then use that. And God will add to you 
just as much as he adds to the person that has 10. And what, what, what I like to say, and, and I heard uh, Pastor Fred Sampson say this too, he said, if your gift is cooking in the kitchen, then you cook those grits to the glory of God and God will bless you just as much as he blesses the person standing in the pulpit. Amen. You have to be content with whatever your gifts might be. You talked a lot about gifts early on, but whatever your gifts are, that's what you have to appreciate. No appreciation, no addition, and certainly no multiplication. There might be some subtraction, but you're not going to get anything else. Nothing. So I'm going to kick the ball back into your command. I'm going to pass it to you. Here you go. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> and, and I agree with you a thousand percent. And, and that's how do we emphasize to our our People in general, okay, I'm going to say that, but in general, that that gift you have, just make it work for you and make it work for others. Absolutely. And 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 um, yeah, God will, you know, make it multiply if He so desires of it. But you got to use that gift. And sure. and uh, uh I, I don't. I look, we got, but we. Again, going back, if we don't teach them about the gift and what it's all about, if we just say, well, you, you know, this is it, and, and, and just um, show them how to take that gift and multiply it. That's right. That's right. I mean, you can't expect people to use a gift that they don't know exists. You sometimes have to identify it for them. And say, like you said to the person who was cleaning the building, I'm just a building, I'm just a cleaner. And you said, but that's a talent. There are transferable skills in everything that you do. You have a talent, you know how to clean. Do you know how many people would love to be, to know how to clean? You go into their homes, you can start a business, a cleaning business, yep. doing things that people, A, don't like to do and maybe can't do. And you can make a fortune if that's your goal, right? Because what you know is how to clean. Don't minimize the clean because things need to get clean. In fact, one of the churches that I'm serving right now, right now, the ceiling fell. They redid the ceiling. We, we, uh, we contracted with a young man that I know to, to come in and clean the sanctuary. And to purify it so that you can spend time in it because the dust and all that kind of stuff, you got to get all that out. Yep. Well, somebody's got to do that. So they'll go in and they'll clean it up and they'll make sure that everything is nice and spick and span. And we'll come back in and the rug will be clean. The seats, you know, the, the pews will be done. Uh, there'll be no dust on the walls. There'll be no dust on the ceilings. There'll be no dust on the pews. We'll be able to breathe and to live and to worship and to praise and to invite others into that environment that they might grow, that they might go to the to what I call it, the execution chamber, so that they can be reinvigorated in the incubation chamber. So, you know, that's what it's about. Um, everything, I mean, everything, 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 whatever you do has a, has a, has a stamp on it, says, it says, manufactured by god Ooh, hallelujah right so what are you going to do with that the manufacturer gave it to you i remember i remember going to west virginia when i was doing um when i was in my seminar when i was in seminary i did my cross-cultural experience there and i met quite a few people but i never forget i met this woman she was the executive director white lady young young girl and her parents had passed away when she was younger and they left her quite a bit of land it was all on the mountain all of it i mean just mountains all over the place about 25 acres of mountains and she says well not much i can do with it i said but it's your mountain you can do anything you want with it i said you, know, you can cut it down if you want to it's your mountain you can raise goats 
Goats love mountains. You can become a sheep herder. They like that kind of stuff. You know, it's your mountain. You do with it what you want. She said, I never thought about that. I said, but you can do whatever you want. In fact, I'm, I wrote a sermon, you know, uh, a, a blessing disguised as a mountain. Because that's what it was to me. I said, if, if somebody give me 25 acres, I don't care what it was. I'd figure out something to do with it. Something. Matter of fact, up here in New York, you remember this, right? Remember the motel on the mountain? Upstate New York by, um, uh, up there by Middletown? Yeah. I remember going up there several times. Like, this is beautiful. Put the whole, put a hotel on the top of the mountain. People will come from miles around to come to your hotel on top of the mountain. It'll be a challenge to build, but once it gets up, it'll be a major thing to, it'll be a major attraction for people to want to see it. It's your mountain. It's your blessing. It's what God gave to you. Don't, don't squander it. Don't, 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 don't despise, don't despise small beginnings. Let the Lord use you by your using the gifts that he gave to you. My yeah. God. Mm. You know, Rev, um, it, it, when you were sharing about that, I, I, the other day, uh, uh, you got junk. Truck was out. You know, somebody was getting rid of the stuff out of their house. Mm. And this guy's global. He's just not new. He's global. Yep. And he, he made a business out of somebody else's junk. junk. And he sells some of that junk. Yep. Yep. Not, and he hires people. He created jobs and, and things like that. So we that's critical thinking. And I, that's one course that I love teaching and getting the kids to think outside the box. You know, if we could get them to think outside the box. Uh, uh, and, well, first, you got to get them to think, period. Well, get them yeah. Think. Get them think. And, yes. Then, yes. Then, then you tell them, say, you know what? There's a box that you live in, but we're going to teach you how to think outside of the box. Critical thinking. That's, in, that's so important. So yeah. important. Yeah. And, and it's us. And that's what the Bible is. is a critical thinking tool. Look, look where what happened and what could happen and what will happen. If you look at the Bible, there's a tool. It's All a right. Tool. You know, a number of years ago, I started this ministry called Back in Stride Again. And I started it because <laughs> I, I ran into a, a friend of mine I hadn't seen in at least 25, 30 years. And uh, when I saw him, I could see it in his face, life was hard, right? We remembered each other because he helped me in a fight when I was in elementary school and I won the fight. And I always thought that I owed Mario one, I owed him one for that. Saw his sister at old timers day and she mentioned Mar I didn't know it was his sister. She said, yeah, he's home. I said, well, he's home. I said, well, he didn't come by. And she said, no, no, but here, and she called him and I spoke to him and he remembered me. All of those years, he remembered me. So I said, man, I need to see you, man. So we got together and he was telling me, I said, well, you know, Mario, what's going on? He said, yeah, you know, I got my degree. He said, but I can't find a job. I said, you can't find, I said, really? I said, what do you do? He says, well, I got a, you know, I got a, a, a bachelor's in, social, in, in, in social work. I'm like social work, man, social work is a dime a dozen. You can find your job as a social worker somewhere. He said, yeah, but you know, it's just been hard. I said, really? He said, yeah, you know, he said, because I, I, I really just got out. I said, you got out? How? So you were down? He said, yeah. I said, how long were you in? He said, 25 years. He got his degree when he was in, incarcerated. And then he started talking to me about cleaning, actually floors, you know, sanding them down and, and re-waxing them and all that kind of stuff. I said, really? He said, man, and he lit up like a, like, like a light when he was talking about it. And I said, well, Mario, that's a business, man. I said, you ever thought about just going into business, doing floors? He said, no. I said, you know, it's not that difficult. I said, do you have a business plan? He looked at me and said, a what? 
<laughs> yeah. And I said, wow. And the Lord said, you can help him. I said, Mario, I owe you one from the time I was a little kid, third grade, never forget it. I'm going to help you write that business plan. He said, really? I said, yeah, because you need to do this. I said, because, you know, as an ex-offender, I know how difficult it is to find a job. That's why he was having difficulties. I said, but if you own your own business, nobody cares whether or not you've been in jail. Nobody even asks. You can get the job done, they'll pay you. And they'll pay you well for it. So then I was talking with him. The Lord said, you can help a lot of other people as well. So I started this ministry back in stride again, working with ex-offenders, helping them to think outside of the box, critical thinking. That's what it brought it to mind. Critical thinking so that they would be able to build their own businesses. I would love to con you know, continue that vein because I know how critically important that is. So by the way, we're almost out of time. So I'm gonna turn it over to you and let you say your final remarks. The Lord has put something on my heart to share with everybody tonight. So, 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 so Chaplain Ron uh, uh, Carson, would you please share with us your own words in your own way? And if we go over a little bit, guys, we won't, we're not going to be that long, but please stay with us. Don't, don't, don't leave us because it turned nine o'clock. So Ron, turn it over to you. Oh Lord, have mercy. Okay. Uh, I, I, first of all, I want to thank you for inviting me. I want to thank everybody that came on board and, and I just pray to God that we all take away something from this night and not only take away, but we apply it to our lives and we reach out and help others and invest in, in their lives and learn from each other and learn from our mistakes and learn that we all have a gift and dig deep and there's opportunities uh, and, and resources out here and ask. I love helping people. I got to learn how to get paid to help, but I <laughs> love helping people, okay? And and and, and um, fear, and, and that's been my biggest issue with all my background and the things that I've done. My students even said, Mr. Carson, you got to get out there. Mm. And I realize I'm full of fear. And, and, and I know the word says we should not fear and all this kind of stuff. So I, I'm going to tell you, <laughs> Lauren, mm -hmm. I met you. I went online and I said, I'm getting me a coach. <laughs> and I'm I'm gonna get into, you know, I have all these gifts, I have all these abilities, I have my plan, but I didn't know how to get out there. And then the Lord, when you reached out to me yesterday, I said, No, he didn't. And 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 I this is my First public speaking opportunity, <laughs> and and I thank you for it. I thank everybody um, for participation. And 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 uh, hey, what can I say? I I just I want to embrace our friendship, and uh, uh, hopefully, no, not hopefully, there will be a future for me and you, and and others through our ministries. Because we both have a ministry, and I know what my ministry is, and, and my ministry is to reach out and touch lives, and and like my card says, my mission is to equip and educate, and I'm going to do that. Praise God! Again, thank you. I love it. I love it. You know, yesterday we had um uh, Saturday actually we had a training of my chaplain's uh, division that we did and we had a, a CPR training and um, we had it at a local church. One of our chaplains is a pastor. So we had it at his church, which is really nice to open the doors and let us to do, allow us to do that. Um, but one of the things that happened, and, and this is a collaborative effort with Rotary and the chaplains. So the question was asked of the pastor, do you have an AED, which is the defibrillator that, you know, portable defibrillator that every place with its mass meetings needs to have, right? The pastor said, no, we don't. The Rotary Club 
the E Club of Heritage, which is the club that did this, that did the uh, CPR training for us. There, there's there two medical doctors, and he brought they brought this staff with him. Hmm. Said to the pastor, "We're going to donate an AED to your church." Now, what a blessing is that? See, you don't have to go far to find people that you can be a blessing to. And there's a story that's told in the book, what every Christian ought to know day by day by Adrian Rogers about a vagabond who spent his entire life walking across the country. Someone asked him, how do you decide where you're going? He said, it really doesn't matter. I just go. And they asked, but what if you come to a fork in the road? Which way do you go then? He said, I pick up a stick, I throw it in the air. Whichever way it lands, that's the way I go. Wow. Then he added, sometimes I have to throw it six or seven times to get it to land right. <laughs> <laughs> and a lot of us are just like that, just like that vagabond. We say we want to know and do God's will, but we keep throwing the stick into the air until it lands the way we want to go. That's not contentment. That's manipulation. Mm. You'll be able to ma ma manip manipulate some people some of the time, but you'll never be able to manipulate God. Paul says that the things that were given to him by the Philippians were nice. But one of the greatest lessons he learned was how to be content in whatever state he was in. It didn't matter if he had material things or not was prosperous or in need, hungry or full, in ecstasy or agony, in jail or free. Paul learned how to be content in any and every situation. He learned from his sky view, not his world view, that whatever he needed, whatever he wanted, whatever he had to do, he could do all things through Christ who strengthened him. If we, as readers of this letter to the Philippian church that Paul wrote, follow the example that Paul gave, we will be able to proudly proclaim that we have also learned one of the greatest lessons to learn. And that is, be content with whatever state you are in. Didn't my guest, weren't he enjoyed I don't know about y'all, but I enjoyed him tonight. We call him Chaplain, but his Thanks. persona is much bigger than that. R Ron Carson is a man who has learned one of life's greatest lessons, and that's to be content in whatever state you are in. What I like about it, many things, but is that he doesn't settle for things just because. He applies himself to everything that he does so that the situation and the circumstances aligned with his efforts. When he said to me tonight that, that, that he had lacked confidence as a young man, and then he topped off and said, fear has been slowing him down. See, that's what I'm talking about. When you embrace who you are, you are content with what you've got. Now God can elevate it to new heights. He's not throwing the stick in the air six or seven times until it points in the direction he thinks he wants to go in. He made his life one of finding contentment wherever the Lord has taken him. Did you notice the progression? D. Wick Clinton, associate's degree, then engineering, then, 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 then the certification. Did you notice the progression? It wasn't stagnant. It was progressing from one thing to another. Ron, you have blessed this assembly of faith tonight, this assembly that I affectionately call the Matters of Faith family. Thank you for living a life that makes it easy for others to glean from the lessons that you've learned on being content in whatever state you're in. One of the greatest lessons to learn. Yeah. And you know what? You said share one thing. So as you were sharing, I didn't know who I was and what I had accomplished until I asked my daughters to look at my resume. Mm. And they went, Daddy, Daddy. And I said, I said, I just did my job. She says, no, Dad, this is beyond. 
beyond. And that's when it, it hit me. And then the Lord has just, I mean, today is another door to open up. Another door opened up that the, the church I'm at, they, they want to start a Bible school. They came to me and said, hey, we want you to be one of the instructors. And I had been reaching out to different colleges, and I'm still going to reach out because I know I need to be in the classroom. And, and as, I share, as I shared with you or whatever, um, when I was teaching at Bronx Community, it's been two years now, um, they came to me and told me, I expect too much from my students. And I said, I don't expect enough from my students. And so that, that just made me more determined to make sure that my, the kids and the you and people in general get educated because nobody's gonna stay, hey, that, that we, we're not capable. And, and that's what I heard from this person from Texas. He came in, doesn't understand the community, doesn't understand the needs. And how I got the job at Bronx Community College, because somebody knew me from the Patterson Project and heard about me. And we were friends way back in the day and said, they need you at Bronx Community College. Now, again, I went, me? And they said, yeah, they need you. And I was one of the first professors that ever get hired on the first interview. Mm. They said, nobody gets hired. Enough. So I had to, you know, all this came up. I, I had to share that. So don't, don't, don't let opportunity pass you by. Somebody out there is watching you and knows you have a gift, whatever that gift is, and take that gift and develop it and make sure you pass the mantle and pass the mantle and pass the mantle. Amen? Amen. Amen. Well, I'm going to just say this. Listen, don't forget our sponsors and advertisers because Ron just laid it out there for you. But the JLR company, J. Lauren R. Consulting LLC, that's my company. Those are my companies. For <laughs> all your church financial needs, call 718-328-8096. 718-328-8096. Or visit our website, www.jlaurenrussellconsulting.com. Do visit the website. I think you'll be impressed and you'll see what we do. www.jlaurenrussellconsulting.com. It's not about the castle. It's about the kingdom. Matters of Faith, the book. I've been talking about it. You've been seeing it on screen. This is the book. If you don't have it, make sure that you get it. The book is $23.40, which covers shipping and handling. However, you can get it as an ebook, and that means that you'll get it immediately. There's no shipping and no handling costs. www.smashwords.com backslash books backslash view, backslash 993177. Now that's been on your screen as well. Scroll back, it's there, so you can get it. Please do. Trust me, it'll bless your life. I guarantee you that. And Better Mag Magazine, make sure that you subscribe, www.abettermag.com to subscribe. It's a two-year subscription. It's only $27.50. Now, that's a two-year subscription. And please don't forget to subscribe, like, and share our Matters of Faith YouTube channel. Watch this now. Telephone, text, email, message, any way you do it, but tell a friend to join us regularly on Matters of Faith, the radio show. We are always on live on Matters of Faith, as well as the J. Lauren Russell Facebook groups. Now, when the show is over, like we'll do tonight, we drop each episode on our Matters of Faith YouTube channel. That's why I ask every week that you subscribe, like, and share the Matters of Faith YouTube channel. Eventually, we want to expand and go to doing it on a YouTube broadcast, but I need you to subscribe, like, and share. Now, the Lord bless you, the Lord keep you, the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Now, if no one told you this today, but I know that someone did because I did it when I showed you my comments from my installation as district governor, but I'm going to say it to you again. I love you, and there's absolutely nothing that you can do about it, so get used to it. God bless you all. You know, as I said, I love you and truly, truly support you in all that you do, so it gives me a great deal of pleasure, and I will say to you, good night, God bless, and we'll see you soon. Thank you. Amen. You're welcome. You're welcome. Don't hang up just yet, bro. Don't, okay. don't close down.